This is Duke University. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Neil Siegel. I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. And I'm very pleased uh, today to have, uh, to present to you folks the panelists that we have to discuss uh, the court's grant of certiorari in the case of Fisher against the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Trina Jones, uh, to my left, is an expert in, among other things, uh, race and the law, uh, civil procedure. Uh, and to her left, we have Professor Guy Charles, uh, who specializes as well in, in, in uh, civil procedure and race and the law, also teaches constitutional law and voting rights. Uh, and then to Guy's left, we have Professor Daryl Miller, who we're uh, very lucky to have visiting us this semester from uh, the University of Cincinnati. And he's teaching, I believe, civil procedure here at the law school, but is also uh, an expert in, in constitutional law and uh, in uh, the, courts, uh, the court's Second Amendment and Seventh Amendment and Thirteenth Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, with respect to each of them, they've, they've just done too much too well for me to, to get it all into the introductions. But we are very fortunate to have them here to discuss uh, the question presented in, in Fisher, which is whether the U University of Texas at Austin violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment through the particular way it uses race in its admissions program. Um, let me just describe for you for a moment uh, my understanding of the program, and then we'll turn it over to Professor Jones uh, for her remarks. After each of our panelists speaks for about 10 minutes, I may or may not have a few thoughts of my own to share with you, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So uh, under Texas's top 10% program, Texas students, that is Texas residents, uh, at the top of their high school class are guaranteed admission to UT Austin. If you're in the top 10% of your high school class, you're guaranteed admission. And that fills about 3 quarters to 80% of the slots for the in-state students. Uh, the university calls the process for admitting the other quarter, or uh, the other 20% to 25% of students, holistic review. And for those spots, applicants are rated uh, on a basis of a number of factors, including test scores, essays, activities, socioeconomic status, cultural background, race, and ethnicity. Uh, Abigail Fisher, the, the name plaintiff in the case, was a white applicant to UT who did not qualify for admission pursuant to the top 10% program and who was denied admission in 2008. She filed a lawsuit in federal court that challenged the holistic review portion of the Texas admissions policy, alleging that she was unlawfully discriminated against because of her race. So I think it's important uh, that what's before the court is not the top 10% program, but the holistic review process that uh, the university uses uh, for the balance of the class that's not admitted pursuant to the top 10% program. The federal district court upheld uh, the holistic <coughs> review portion of the, uh, of the admissions policy, as did a three-judge panel of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, uh, which relied on the Supreme Court's 2003 decision in Grutter against Bollinger, where the court held 5-4 while Justice O'Connor was still on the court and writing the majority opinion, that universities may use race as a plus factor as part of an affirmative action admissions program. They may not use quotas. They may not assign a set number of points uh, to an applicant's application on the basis of race or ethnicity. The Fifth Circuit declined to rehear the case and bank by a very closely divided vote of 9-7. to seven. So with that background in mind, I'm going to turn it now over to Professor Jones. OK, so I like to stand when I talk. What I thought I'd do as part of my presentation was to situate the Fisher case within the larger uh, socio-political landscape. And so what I'd like to do is talk about three things. One, the importance of education to economic mobility. Two, the benefits and harms of affirmative action. And three, I'll offer some uh, thoughts on Fisher and the likely outcome, although it's always a dangerous business to try to predict what the Supreme Court uh, will do. But just looking at economic uh, mobility, now it's important to keep in mind that affirmative action programs exist in a lot of different contexts, not just education, but also employment, contracting, broadcast licensing, and so on and so forth. Since, of course, Fisher occurs with regards to education, I thought I'd look at uh, education uh, and its impact uh, 
on economic uh, mobility. This is from the Brookings Institute and a study that was done by Ron Haskins in 2010 uh, about the relationship between education uh, and economic status. From this figure, uh, you'll note that uh, with increasing levels of education, income tends to uh, increase. So this is from 1964, uh, data from 1964 to 2004. And you'll see that the uh, more educational achievement an individual has, the higher their income uh, tends to be. If you look at more closely, so the bottom line are those individuals who are high school dropouts. Uh, and then you have the second line are those who have a high school uh, degree, uh, and then four-year college degree, and then professional and graduate degree. The more education you have, the higher your level uh, of income. But note also what happens in terms of this relationship between education and income. Uh, those who have a high school degree or less high school dropouts, uh, their incomes tend to have tend to be stagnant uh, over time, whereas individuals with a college degree uh, or a professional and graduate degree have seen an increase uh, over time in terms of uh, their income. The other thing I thought might be interesting uh, to consider, these are high school graduation rates by gender and ethnic group. Uh, and note that there is uh, a significant difference between graduation rates of Hispanics, Latinos, uh, blacks, whites, uh, and uh, Asians. Uh, in addition to that, college graduation uh, rates are, are different depending upon uh, your race, right? Uh, where we see uh, that whites uh, are almost twice as likely uh, to graduate from college uh, as are blacks and Latinos, uh, and then Asians uh, have exceeded uh, all uh, ethnic groups uh, for uh, some period of time. The importance of this, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to go really quickly here, is to show that education is, in fact, uh, a way of getting ahead. Education is tremendously important to economic uh, well-being. Turning to affirmative action uh, and its role in terms of educational access. It's been well documented that affirmative action has played a role in securing greater access to educational institutions uh, for people of color and for women, especially in highly selective uh, educational institution, elite colleges uh, and universities. The estimates in terms of how important this is range from 2% to 40% uh, looking at, uh, depending upon which data uh, one considers. But I think the most persuasive uh, data in terms of the uh, effect are the importance of affirmative action programs or what has happened in those cases uh, when uh, affirmative action programs have been uh, abolished. Uh, so for example, in California in the mid-90s in the aftermath of Proposition 209, uh, when uh, race was not allowed to be considered uh, in uh, university, public university admissions, uh, enrollments rate, enrollment rates dropped substantially uh, by a fourth across the UC system uh, and among flagship campuses within the University of California system uh, by about about 50 uh, percent. You see the same thing happening in the aftermath of the Hopwood uh, case in uh, Texas uh, and in the aftermath of the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative in Michigan. Of course, the drop-offs were uh, different depending upon uh, the state, but you see an appreciable decline in terms of the presence of students of color uh, at the flagship campuses uh, within these public university uh, systems. Indeed, in yesterday's New York Times, uh, the president of the UC, the University of California system, uh, in commenting on the importance of affirmative action, uh, said, if uh, we had affirmative action as one of our tools, we'd do better with regards to Hispanics and significantly better with regards to African Americans. So, so that's some uh, real data in terms of the importance of affirmative action in, ter in terms of securing access for uh, people of color. So there are significant benefits uh, for people of color. The question becomes, at what cost uh, to uh, whites? One of the common complaints that one hears in discussions of affirmative action, especially uh, in recent years, is that deserving whites are being displaced by undeserving pe people of color, particularly uh, African Americans and uh, Latinos. Now, these arguments were made uh, in 1978. In the Bakke case, we saw them in Bruder and Graz. The Michigan case is from 2003. Uh, and of course, this is also part of the discussion in uh, Fisher. So the argument here is not only that lesser qualified people of color are being chosen over more highly credentialed uh, whites, but affirmative action, these race conscious affirmative action programs are uh, to blame. Several studies 
however, have demonstrated that the impact of race-conscious admissions programs on whites is much more limited than the public actually thinks. Uh, and Goodwin Liu, who was a scholar at UC Berkeley, who is now on the California Supreme Court, uh, wrote uh, an influential article uh, dealing with what he called uh, the causation uh, fallacy and why it is that people make this association, uh, erroneous association, between the impact of affirmative action on whites um, uh, well, well, people overemphasize the influence of affirmative action on educational access for whites. He uh, terms this a causation fallacy, and he said it's the common uh, mistaken notion that when white applicants like Alan Bakke, the plaintiff in the Bakke case, fail to gain admission ahead of minority applicants with equal or lesser qualifications, then the likely cause is affirmative uh, action. But he points out in this very thoughtful article, uh, and others have made uh, a similar uh, argument, that in any admissions process where the applicants, the number of applicants, greatly outnumbers uh, the number of, where the number of white applicants uh, greatly outnumber the number of minority applicants, substantial preferences for minority applicants will not significantly diminish the odds of admission facing uh, white uh, applicants. In other words, whites actually do not stand uh, a much better chance of admission in the absence of affirmative action. Now, some uh, applicants who are white uh, would never get in, he points out, uh, even in the absence uh, of affirmative action. There are others, uh, like uh, Alan Bakke and the plaintiffs in Gruder and Graz, and perhaps the plaintiff in Fisher, who also would not get in in the absence of affirmative action. And he points out that that small group of applicants who might have the better chance of securing admission, uh, who are probably the best plaintiffs in these cases, but who don't bring these cases, um, uh, are, are not present because they tend to get into other universities, right? So they have multiple offers of acceptance uh, and therefore uh, they tend not to bring uh, losses. But the important point here is uh, that the presence of a race conscious affirmative action program uh, doesn't necessarily uh, impact uh, the chances of white applicants in terms of access uh, to uh, admissions. So while affirmative action helps uh, people of color, it doesn't significantly burden uh, white applicants. This is a big uh, misconception. With that in mind, um, the next question becomes, um, well, if uh, the impact of affirmative action on whites is limited, and if the returns to minorities uh, and women uh, are large, uh, shouldn't we be overly concerned about what's happening in the Fisher uh, case? One could be, and I am concerned about Fisher, but I think that it's really important uh, to keep Fisher in a uh, larger context, right? Uh, where we have high school dropout rates uh, for Latinos and African Americans, which are dramatically higher uh, than what you see with whites. Uh, we have uh, African Americans and Latinos increasingly being disproportionately engaged with the criminal justice systems. Uh, we have African Americans and Latinos earning su substantially less than their white counterparts and being segregated in lower paying and lower status occupations. The unemployment rate for African Americans, Latinos uh, in this country is substantially higher, almost double when it comes to African Americans, that of whites. Um, African Americans and Latinos are twice as likely to be impoverished. Wealth differentials are huge when it comes uh, to race. The median net worth of white households is more than 20 times that of blacks and 18 times that of Latinos. In real terms, uh, the typical black household has $5,000 in wealth. Latinos have about $6,000. Whites have over $100,000 in wealth. I point this out uh, just to say we have to keep affirmative action uh, in, uh, in context, right? Um, Affirmative action does secure access for some people uh, to educational opportunity, which does, in fact, uh, affect some of these larger systemic issues. But it's not a remedy uh, for widespread, some would say institutionalized, systemic uh, racial uh, subordination. And indeed, the reason I have this uh, triangle up is uh, about a year ago, Lonnie Guineer, who's a professor at Harvard uh, Law School, uh, made the point that sometimes we overemphasize affirmative action when in fact it's a Band-Aid uh, on a metastasizing cancer uh, is what uh, I think uh, 
what she said. Uh, and her point was, if you have uh, a racial hierarchy in the United States uh, where people of color are disproportionately in the bottom uh, uh, of the hierarchy uh, and then are, are represented uh, to some extent in the middle class uh, and then even fewer among the elites, she said, what affirmative action uh, does policies like that being employed by the University of Texas is that it moves some people from the middle of the triangle and people of color are represented by the light blue uh, in this triangle. So it has a tendency to move people of color from the middle of the triangle to the top of the triangle. Uh, so some small subgroup of the population will have access to greater educational opportunity and perhaps economic opportunity, but isn't, it doesn't do anything to disrupt uh, the triangle, the larger systemic issues confronting uh, people of color. So while affirmative action is getting a lot of attention uh, and has served an important uh, purpose historically, uh, we have to keep in mind that it's not a remedy for uh, racial uh, subordination uh, across the board and keep it in perspective. So with that uh, as background, I probably have two minutes left. Okay, um, I'm really rushing to try to get this through. Uh, what's the likely outcome uh, in uh, the uh, Fisher uh, case? As I said, this is always a risky uh, business. I tend to be a legal realist, so I think that the changing composition of the court uh, matters a lot, and I've demonstrated uh, how the court has changed in this slide uh, from 2003 when Grutter was decided to the 2012, uh, which is, of course, the uh, composition of the court that will decide uh, the uh, Fisher uh, case. Note that there's been substantial uh, change since 2003. I think the most important comparison, however, is between uh, 2007 and uh, today, and who is likely uh, to actually uh, uphold or rule against uh, the uh, Texas uh, policy. And as you can see, Justice Kagan has recused herself, um, and so the court uh, is basically split uh, depending upon what Justice Kennedy uh, decides to do. He was a swing vote in parents involved, uh, and he's likely to be uh, the determining vote uh, in the Fisher case uh, as well. I'm assuming that Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Breyer will uh, uphold, uh, uh, vote to uphold the policy, whereas Scalia, Thomas, and Roberts, based upon what they said and did in the parents involved, are likely to say that it is, in fact, uh, unlawful. So then, um, and Alito. So the question is, can Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Breyer convince Kennedy uh, to somehow uphold this policy? Well, if you look at what Kennedy did in Grutter, uh, you would think where he was with uh, the minority, you'd think, well, maybe uh, not. But if you go look very carefully at the uh, concurring opinion written by Kennedy in uh, parents involved, there might be some room uh, to hope. So just looking at what Justice Kennedy actually said uh, in uh, Parents Involved, he said diversity, depending upon its meaning and definition, is a compelling educational goal uh, that a school district may pursue. So unlike the other uh, justices in the plurality and parents involved, he actually thought that diversity could be a compelling state interest. But then he went on to say, uh, what the government is not permitted to do, absent a showing of necessity, uh, which wasn't made, he said, on the facts of that case, is to classify students on the basis of race and to assign each of them to schools based upon uh, that classification. So what he, seemed to, what he did in Paris Involved was to say diversity is a compelling state interest, but you cannot uh, make a race-based classification. That leads me to conclude, um, and if Starr decides this is to mean anything, and if the court is at all concerned about legitimacy, I don't think that the court, I think the court is concerned about legitimacy. Um, I don't think the court is going to reverse uh, Bruder uh, and Rott on the <coughs> principle that the educational benefits of diversity is a compelling state int interest. I think Kennedy will sign on to that. He signed on to that uh, in uh, Parents Involved, this case from 2007. But I do think uh, the, that Kennedy is going to say that the means being employed uh, by uh, the state of Texas are not sufficiently narrowly tailored. Indeed, he'll probably argue uh, that they are unnecessary <coughs> uh, in light of the fact that the percentage plan has secured uh, access to uh, Texas's educational system for uh, people of color. So that's my prediction with regards uh, to uh, parents involved. Uh, I think Kennedy is going to be key, and I think that he will sign on to diversity being a compelling state interest, but I think he's going to say that using race 
uh, in a race-conscious manner. Uh, it's not sufficiently narrowly tailored uh, and perhaps unnecessarily. And at the end of the day, I think that basically guts, Bruder, and Grotz of significant uh, meaning. So the principle stands, but it's a principle without any real uh, thrust or, or weight. And then what's next? Next year, I wonder if we'll be sitting here talking about whether percentage plans are constitutional. And if that is, in fact, uh, the future, uh, then we are indeed, uh, from my point of view, uh, in a grave uh, circumstance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jones. We'll hear now from Professor Charles. So I am going to pick off, pick up from where Professor Jones left off. Um, clearly, we are all uh, members of the same religious group. Um, we are all worshiping at the altar of Justice Kennedy <laughs> and uh, praying and divining for some clues as to how the world is going to operate and asking ourselves, oh, Justice Kennedy, what shall we do? What will you do? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I won't be long. Professor Jones uh, covered a lot of what is important here. Um, so the first thing is, and I'll emphasize the fact that Justice Kennedy does think that the diversity rationale is um, an important and a compelling state interest. Uh, and that, at least as a point of departure, um, provides at least a doctrinal framework within which um, the case can be thought about, which is very different from the conservatives, is this fellow conservatives for whom uh, certainly that's the case for uh, for Justice Thomas and likely Justice Scalia, but but more, but also the Chief Justice and Justice Alito, um, that uh, the diversity rationale is not a compelling state interest, and I think this does differentiate. Justice Kennedy, and a point that I want to return to is also the place where Professor Jones left off, which is, uh, is this meaningful in any way? So I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing that I think is, is interesting um, is that Justice Kennedy has increasingly shown more solicitude for the circumstances in which uh, folks of color find themselves. If you look at the early Kennedy opinion on race, and then you look at the later Kennedy opinions on race, um, there are two different sets of opinions. In many ways, um, or perhaps in some ways, you might think of Justice Kennedy as evolving in the way that Justice O'Connor evolved. Um, and, in, and what's most interesting is that Justice O'Connor's evolution was completed after she left the court. There was something that she said um, after she left the court, and you and you and you wondered, well, why didn't you say that when you were on the court? Um, apparently, she had some perspectives um, that uh, that uh, provided her with a broader framework than on the court. But uh, but over time, there was an evolution, and I think we're seeing something of a, of an evolution from Justice Kennedy. And this is also where um, not just the parents involved case is is particularly important, but. Um, a voting rights case that I won't bore you with, although there's nothing boring at all about voting rights cases. They are absolutely exciting, scintillating, stimulating, fascinating, and you must all take Keep voting trying. rights classes. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, this is a way of asking for more students. Um, so uh, it just is, in that case, Justice Kennedy was very, for the first time, really thought um, talked about not, talked about race in a way that showed um, a fair amount of nuance, uh, but also uh, employed a section, a race conscious section of the Voting Rights Act, um, in favor of maintaining or creating a Latino district, which would have been unthinkable um, looking at Justice Kennedy's opinions uh, five or seven years earlier. Uh, so there's a way in which he has become, um, at least in word, and maybe not in deed yet, uh, we'll see, um, much more solicitous, much more careful, uh, and attempts to reconcile a conservative framework with the equality concerns of, uh, of folks of color. And it really is what this, this idea is what led Justice O'Connor in the Grutter case 
um, to take a different tack. And when you when you read Grutter and you read Justice O'Connor's concern um, for the legitimacy of institutions, right? So Justice O'Connor takes a view that, look, institutions that are predominantly white lack legitimacy in the eyes of voters, of citizens of color. Um, that's an, a, a fairly radical shift, especially from um, a slightly right of center perspective. And the question, of course, is whether Justice Kennedy can get to that last step. Um, and, and if he does, then that, that changes the, the calculus altogether. Um, finally, uh, well, not quite finally, but almost finally, um, Justice Kennedy certainly has a narrow view of the type of governmental programs that uh, that the state can use. Um, but he also has talked about this two two-tiered approach, that yes, you can use race, but first you must try alternative measures, right? And there's a way in which this Texas program um, is going to test Justice Kennedy's resolve of uh, first should you r try race-neutral measures, and then you can use race in a very narrow way. Um, and this also goes to the legitimacy point that uh, Professor Jones was talking about, to what extent uh, does the court, and, and particularly Justice Kennedy, care about uh, establishing a framework and having institutions follow that framework? So what Texas did is they did the top 10% plan, then they conducted conducted extensive uh, research, and the opinion below uh, in the Texas and the uh, Court of Appeals, where it was written by a right of center Court of Appeals judge, um, really the, demonstrated that Texas uh, conducted ex extensive research to show that, look, this top 10% plan isn't enough to, to produce the type of equality and opportunities that we want in our educational system. So, for example, we have some classes in which there are no folks of color in, in those classes, and they think that's to the detriment of both the students who are there in those classes as well as the ones who are absent. So, in many respects, uh, this is Texas, an institution responding to the state of the doctrine as they understand it, as the court as a whole has laid it out, in crafting a program that in many respects should respond to uh, the median uh, justice in the swing vote, which in this case happens to be Justice Kennedy. So I think this does present a question of to what extent um, will the court uh, respond to the move by institutions to be thoughtful about the way that they implement and think about race, uh, particular trying to limit uh, the uh, downsides the court sees with a wide-ranging uh, affirmative action and race-conscious program, but attempting first to come up with a, a race-neutral program that in fact has a lot of benefits in a number of different directions, but then saying, okay, on top of that, we've conducted the research and see the need for something else, and this is supposed to respond to the doctrine in particular. So now the question is, look, um, and, and, and in some ways this is going to be a question as to whether uh, the doctrinal framework does matter, right? I think it does, it will turn on a question of legitimacy. If the lines increasingly keep, if the lines are moved constantly, that is, if the court says, here is the court as a whole, says, well, here's where we think we ought to draw the line with respect to race, con race consciousness, and institutions follow upon that and draw, and, and draw their plans to respond to where the court thinks it ought to be, and the court continually moves the line, and we're talking about the constitution of top 10% plans a year or two down the road, um, then I think to me that calls into question uh, some fundamental principles of how we think about doctrine and how we think about constitutional law, and most importantly, how the court thinks about equality writ large, especially as it regards uh, folks of color, and I'll stop here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Charles. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll hear now from Professor Miller. Oh, well, thanks uh, for having me out, and uh, um, thanks for coming out to, to listen to this panel. I think this is, a, you know, obviously a really important issue. Um, I think that um, uh, the way I'm going to sort of frame my, my remarks really is to talk about this decision in a kind of framework of, of doctrine and constitutional theory. Uh, because I think with the cert grant in Fisher, 
uh, we're seeing at least uh, an indication that maybe the court, uh, contrary to what the Chief Justice had um, uh, said when he was uh, in his uh, confirmation hearings, is not really approaching these uh, cases in what Cass Sunstein would say, a sort of Burkean minimalist way, um, but is instead, uh, again, using sort of Cass Sunstein's language, um, trying to reach towards a sort of conservative perfectionism, the idea that precedent or history, even originalist methodologies, uh, have to uh, be jettisoned over uh, for some kind of ideal about um, conservative notions of uh, liberty, uh, lack of uh, government involvement in private affairs, and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, and I think that um, it's clear that the court is uh, in, in giving uh, cert to this is not that concerned with precedent I, it, writ large. I mean, you know, Justice O'Connor in the, in the Grutter case says, uh, you know, 25 years, maybe we'll reevaluate. Well, it's been half that, uh, less than half that already, and we've got a cert petition sort of uh, addressing a, a, a question that I'm sure that a lot of the litigants in the Grutter litigation thought was over at least for a generation, and, and we don't see that. Um, I don't think we'll even see that much sort of discussion, and I'll talk about this a little bit more about the, uh, you know, historical meaning of the Equal Protection Clause. We didn't see a lot of that in the in the sort of Grutter context. Instead, we had sort of a narrow um, discussion about what does um, Baki mean? What did Justice Powell mean when he talked about the uh, interests in diversity in higher education? And, and that's the sort of organizing principle um, uh, that uh, Professor Jones and uh, Professor Charles have talked about already. That's the, the, the talk about. And, and once you say that's a legitimate goal, how do you narrowly tailor a standard for that? Um, and I would wager that whatever decision we see after the Fisher case is not going to be um, uh, originalist uh, in any sort of sense of the word, except maybe a, a pure sort of textual matter. That is, what does equality, equal protection mean as a facial matter? We're certainly not going to see, I would predict, um, as many people have noted, a lot of the fact uh, that, you know, the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 are all born for a certain purpose. Therefore, a purpose of elevating um, a class of people stigmatized based on race from a uh, condition of um, uh, uh, social, uh, economic, and educational subservience. Um, and, uh, you know, you would think that it, the, the, the court that can create a, a consensus, you know, about the proper way to at least approach a, a problem as to the Second Amendment would, if it's really serious about this as an analytical, analytical method, you know, see, you know, is there any analog uh, between the Freedmen Bureau setting up um, uh, educational opportunities and what's going on uh, by the states here? Um, but I doubt that we'll see any of that, and, and in part maybe because the train is, has already left the station and there's a, uh, an intense focus on uh, Harlan's idea of a colorblind constitution that tends to sort of evaporate um, most of these notions um, of, of what was the actual purpose of these uh, uh, Reconstruction Amendments in the first place. So I, I doubt that we're going to see a lot uh, uh, of that discussion. I could be surprised, but I doubt it. Um, so where does that uh, leave us? Uh, well, I think that um, uh, Professor uh, Jones has, I mean, I identified the, you know, the, um, the decision point very much so, and so is uh, Professor Charles. It's Kennedy. What does Kennedy think? Uh, how is this going to be articulated in a way that Justice Kennedy will either appreciate, and I think that the handicaps that we've seen so far are pretty uh, pretty good. That is, we'll have some uh, discussion about diversity, uh, again, with uh, perhaps a, uh, a majority or plurality of the court saying diversity in higher education is okay, um, but then uh, striking down what uh, Texas has done and really leaving uh, a big question about um, what exactly would survive um, uh, a narrow tailoring um, uh, a narrow tailoring test in terms of uh, uh, achieving diversity. Um, and, you know, I think we have to sort of understand this case in the larger context, notwithstanding what um, uh, Professor Charles has uh, just said, 
Uh, it seems to me that what we see with the court in a case like this or in a case like uh, Rishi or a, in a case like um, Namundo, which is the um, voting rights cases, uh, you know, at least a, a plurality of the court really itching uh, to say that the entire reconstruction slash civil rights project is over, we're all done with that, um, and um, we're not going to be in the business of, of doing any kind of prophylactic legislation or uh, encouragement of, 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 of these kinds of issues, and that the entire uh, project is done and part of the past. Um, and, you know, look, they, the, the plurality would have some reason to to cheer, right? I mean, there would be data points. It's not like uh, we have the same type of problems as existed in 1968, 1965, 1866. But it doesn't mean that the impact of um, that legacy isn't involved. And it seems to me that if we're going to really care about civil rights, civil rights in, in part is about addressing the um, the sort of background norms that create the problems as um, um, Professor Jones has identified. It seems to me that uh, <clears throat> reconstruction and civil rights and all this legislation is a way of impressing upon people to take into account people that they otherwise would not take into account of. And diversity accomplishes that goal in a very important way. Uh, it puts people at the table that are going to be attentive to things that other people are not going to be attentive to. And not only that, it helps in the sense that people that are at the table uh, actually have to start thinking about, well, if I create these structures, if I do this type of, uh, if I get this type of policy, how is it going to impact uh, certain communities? Um, uh, and I think that that sort of idea of uh, getting at the sort of res uh, the residuum of the uh, the fact that we uh, for you know generations uh, was a slave society and for many generations afterward were a Jim Crow society is something that the court wants to uh, take off the table in, in terms of affirmative legislative behaviors to to get at that type of problem um, and with that I'll turn it over to Neil. All right. Well, well thank you. These. Uh all these, all these interventions. Uh, these, these three thoughtful interventions have have inspired me uh, to to share some thoughts of my own, and we, we'll still have time for questions. I, I think it's important to ask ourselves, uh, what kind of justice is Justice Kennedy on matters of race? Right? And, and there's, traditionally, there's a duality or a dichotomy. There are the race conservatives who believe in color blindness who think that there's a particular harm that the Equal Protection Clause protects us from. It's the harm that occurs when the government has race in mind, takes race into account in doling out burdens and benefits. Is he that kind of justice? I think it's clear that the, the four conservatives on the court are, uh, but is he that? Uh, or is he a race progressive, right? Race progressives view the harm that the Equal Protection Clause protects us from very differently. The harm for race, protect, for race progressives are government actions that reflect or reinforce the inferior social status of historically excluded groups. Right? It's not about racial classifications. It's not about race consciousness. It's certain kinds of classifications in consciousness. We're not all even similarly situated with respect to the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, I, I, I suspect uh, the four liberals on the court right, um, um, fall roughly into that category, uh, at least more into that category than into the category of racial conservatives. What about Justice Kennedy? And what I would suggest is that, that the traditional duality doesn't accurately capture him. I think he's in a third category of his own. Uh, and I think it's a category that Justice O'Connor was in while she was on the court and that Justice Powell was in, although there are also meaningful differences among them. And, and, I, and I call Kennedy uh, uh, an anti-Balkanization justice, right? It's something in between. Uh, on the one hand, he shares with the progressives the view that it is not only okay, but it's also sometimes important for government to take race <laughs> into account, to be race conscious in decision making, to realize what in Parents and Baldi called Brown's goal or dream of equal educational opportunity. Right? And he shares that with the progressives, but at the same time, along with the conservatives, he's very concerned about the particular ways or means in which government uses race. 
right? So government may use race to realize Brown's goal, to redress the enduring social dislocations of race that Professor Miller talked about, slavery and Jim Crow and the rest of the, of the whole, of the whole sorry story, right? But it must do so in ways that don't unduly or gratuitously unnecessarily balkanize the political community, right? That minimize the extent to which as a result of the race conscious intervention, we're gonna see ourselves as members of dueling groups defined by race and ethnicity competing for the same scarce resources. And that's why I think he pref prefers using race in what he calls general indirect ways, not in the very specific personal ways of individual racial classifications. So in Parents Involved, he says that it's okay for government to draw attendance zones with race in mind. It's okay to compile racial statistics. It's okay to strategically cite schools with race in mind. Right? Um, he rejects the idea of colorblindness. At the same time, he's very concerned about telling an individual student, you can't go to this school just because of your race. He says that offends individual dignity and that runs a risk of balkanizing the community. He doesn't say you can never use racial classifications. He says use it as a last resort when the other formerly race-neutral, general indirect ways fail. This relates directly to Ricci. This is the New Haven firefighters case. What is the problem for Justice Kennedy and Ricci? Justice Scalia is saying maybe all of disparate impact under Title VII violates the Equal Protection Clause. It's race conscious. Right? Is the problem drawing up a test to become a firefighter with race in mind or throwing out a test after you've administered it because of the racial consequences? I think a racial conservative is going to see those two situations in roughly the same ways. I think Justice Kennedy is going to see them in very different ways. I think the real problem in Ricci for Justice Kennedy is the fact that you threw it out. After everyone knows the results and everyone knows very explicitly you're doing it because of the racial consequences. Right? So if he's an anti-balkanization justice, and I'm right about that, uh, I don't think he's going to be enthusiastic about joining the racial conservative movement to just get rid of Title VII as violating the Equal Protection Clause as opposed to enforcing it. What about here uh, in, in Fisher? Well, um, uh, you've got a top 10% program that's responsible for almost all of the racial and ethnic diversity in the incoming class. Um, you've got uh, 363 African Americans enrolled from Texas high schools in 2008. 305 of them are a product of the 10% plan, which to be clear is race conscious. These plans arose for a reason. It was a, a way to achieve a substantial measure of racial and ethnic diversity without using race, uh, racial classifications and affirmative action as traditionally understood. But they don't use formal racial classifications. If you're in the top 10% of your plan, class, you get in. And in order to be successful, right, you have to have racially identifiable high schools. Right? That's, why, right, that's why these plans have worked where they have and why they don't work for law school admissions uh, for uh, for example. So you had 305 a result of the 10% plan, 58 a result of holistic review. So 84% of the African Americans in the class were produced by the percent plan. Uh, with respect to Latinos, you had 88% produced by the 10% plan, 12% from holistic review. So to put it differently, the affirmative action, the, 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 race, uh, the race as a plus factor, the holistic review, which is all that's before the court, increases African American enrollment from 4.8% to 5.7% um, and uh, Latino enrollment from 18.4% to 20.9%, right? So what are we gonna do about, what, what is to be, what, does the, what do these numbers mean for Justice Kennedy? On the one hand, you can say that you've already got uh, what the Grutter Court called a critical mass without even using a racial classification. And my guess is that Kennedy's gonna like the percent plan a lot more than he's gonna like the racial classifications. I think that's what makes him a racial balkanization justice, not, not a, uh, a colorblindness justice. And so you could argue that there's only a marginal increase in racial diversity through using racial classifications. You've got a lot of diversity already without it. That's a reason to strike this down without overruling Grutter, but to distinguish it. And we've never dealt with a situation in which you have formally race neutral means like a racial conscious, race conscious attendance zone producing a lot of diversity, and then you've got racial classifications on top of that. On the other hand, right, it does seem a little unusual to say that the problem with the affirmative action racial classification is that they're not using race enough, right? That it would be less constitutionally suspect if they use race more. He seemed to suggest the opposite in Grutter, that the problem was not that race was being used as a factor, but it was being used too much. 
right? So I suppose there's still some possibility that he will say uh, the limited extent to which race is used as part of racial classifications is a reason to uphold the plan, um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, holding my breath uh, for, that, for that outcome. He's yet to uphold uh, an affirmative action program. He's, he's yet to uphold um, a, a race conscious intervention, although he's written important opinions empowering right, other governmental actors uh, to continue to use race, and oftentimes in much the same way that they did, that they did before. I think the question of the percent plans, I think that, that Professor Jones was getting to, that I don't think that's going to be this case, but it is, it is the next case. And I think you'll see the five most conservative justices on the court, if I'm right, uh, splintering, splintering on that question. I, I, I'm not sure that Justice Thomas and Justice Kennedy are going to see that, uh, see that the, same, uh, the same way. All right, so let's stop there. We've got 15 minutes and open it up to you folks for uh, questions, comments, concerns. Yes, Ethan. I was just wondering to what extent you anticipate um, a majority of being written by Kennedy or um, cutting back at the level of deference that Grutter was willing to give to universities, or will he stick with the deference that Grutter allowed but distinguish it? I should say Ethan is Justice Kennedy in my Supreme Court seminar. So he's very uh, he's very familiar. Does anyone want to take a? I just want to ask Ethan. Do you know what you're going to do in this case or not? No, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> Well, clearly, I mean, Justice Kennedy was troubled by <clears throat> by the deference <laughs> in Grutter. Um, and part of the question is to what extent this case is written in a way that um, <clears throat> that uses Grutter as a precedent or is written in a way, as Professor Siegel says, that you could say, look, this is a different case from the one that we saw in Grutter. Um, a, you know, for those of you who, um, who remember your con law days or are still in the con law, it, it reminds me a bit of Justice Kennedy in City of Bernie, uh, right, cutting back on the Katzenbach versus Morgan type of approach, right? So you could you could see something similar in in this opinion, where cutting back on Grutter, not totally eradicating it, but narrowing it down. Or you could see um, Justice Kennedy writing an opinion that excuses Grutter altogether and, and simply says, that is just not this case. Um, and obviously, I have no idea what, what's going to happen. And if you have no idea what's going to happen, then I'm certainly at sea. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think the problem with Grutter is that Justice O'Kennedy, Justice O'Kennedy, hear that? <laughs> not the first time I've done that. Justice O'Connor said one thing and did something else. And that gives everybody something to work with. She talked the talk of strict scrutiny. She walked the walk of intermediate scrutiny, right? So she's saying strict scrutiny deference. And so you have some judges saying, let's look at what the court did. This is not like other contexts in which race really gets strict scrutiny. Imagine UT was trying to exclude African Americans, right? Or imagine Michigan was. You get a very different version of strict scrutiny. And so here in the Fifth Circuit, you have Judge Edith Jones, a uh, very conservative judge on the Fifth Circuit, writing a dissent from the denial of rehearing in bank talking about strict scrutiny and how that's incompatible with deference and narrow tailoring means narrow tailoring, right? I suspect if Justice Kennedy is writing uh, for himself or for the court, uh, I think it would be very much like him to be, uh, he could just say this is not Grutter, right? But I, I, sus I think it would be very much like him to uh, begin the process or maybe end the process, but I think probably more likely to begin the process of recasting Grutter in the terms that he finds acceptable and focusing on what the court said as opposed to what I think the court did. By the way, know that there are going to be eight justices deciding this case, so you could get a majority of 5-3, uh, depending upon what happens with Kennedy, but you might have a split court, right, a 4-4. Four, four. A split decision affirms the lower court's ruling, uh, which would be affirming the upholding of the policy by the Fifth Circuit, but the Kennedy opinion and how he crafts it, right, is going to be determinative of what... Uh, what Grutter means going forward in terms of diversity as compelling state interests as well as narrowly tailoring, which is why mm -hmm. all the emphasis is being placed upon trying to secure Kennedy and the importance of his opinion. Right. If, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you are in favor of affirmative action, the most you can hope for is affirming 4-4 by an equally divided court, which as a technical matter is not going to have any pres presidential effect. But nonetheless, if Justice Kennedy is speaking on this right. issue, right, that's going to have, that's going to have an effect. Uh, Related to, the, to, to these two questions, I, the, the, the question I would think is that whether um, 
Chief Justice Roberts assigns the majority opinion to, to Justice Kennedy. And I can imagine, especially because Kagan has recused herself, he'd be more inclined not to. Because he has four votes in his pocket, he might write it himself, and then Kennedy maybe would have a concurrence. Um, but I guess this is a question. You know, if Roberts is thinking that way, is a four to three to one or four to one to three case, is that, does that have binding precedent? Well, who, uh, whose side is Kennedy on? The yeah, one. He's writing for himself. Right, but is he affirming or is he reversing? Uh, would he have to choose? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Unlike philosophy, at the end of the day, something is going to be yeah, done. Not, <laughs> not in the VF case. He barely chose. Right. But, I, I mean, is the, yeah, is the court, I mean, he's got to vote to affirm or reverse the Fifth Circuit, right? So is he upholding the program or is he striking it down? The, the, the first question is, is what does Roberts do to assigning the, assigning the opinion? Sure. Um, and I, I would think, and I'm guessing this is a question, whether his calculus would change uh, because Kagan is recusing herself. I think he still needs, he still needs Kennedy to have, uh, to have a majority, <clears throat> right? Because if it's 4-4, then you uphold the program because that's what the Fifth Circuit held. So if he wants a majority, he still needs Kennedy. Now, what he does to get Kennedy, he decided to write himself and parents involved, and he lost Kennedy. At least that's my strong suspicion, is that he originally he started writing a majority opinion, and he ended up writing a plurality opinion because Kennedy wrote for himself. right? So that might counsel in favor of giving it uh, to Kennedy and letting him control it if he thinks he can keep his vote that way. Uh, but he didn't do that in parents involved, and, and the chief's a sophisticated uh, guy when it, comes, when, it, when it comes to these matters. So. Uh, maybe he learned from the experience, right? Or, or maybe it's more important for him to say uh, what he and four other justices believe than it is to have, um, right, to have the majority he wants. He could write for them, and then Kennedy could also vote with them on narrower grounds. Uh, he could do that as well. I, I mean, I think that's, I mean, this will, I mean, I'm glad you raised the, the question, because I think um, that uh, if, if the chief does write uh, for a plurality, uh, it will sort of um, feed into this idea about you know what what kind of justice is the chief uh, because I can imagine a scenario in which the chief does write is not worried about Kennedy uh, Kennedy writes a concurrence perhaps saying you know I still think diversity is okay but the uh, this plan as it's implemented is unconstitutional and then that becomes the um, you know, that becomes the beachhead for further types of movement conservative issues like going after, you know, 10% uh, plans or other kinds of plans. And then you start having arguments over what exactly is the holding of Fisher in the same way that you say, what is the, you know, what was the holding of, uh, of Baki? And you have an argument about that sort of threshold Marx issue, uh, and that's where it's litigated, which I would, you know, suspect that if you were, a, a, you know, uh, the plaintiff's attorney for Fisher, you, it's not a bad outcome, really. You, you, you're, you're setting yourself up for more, for more litigation down the road. That reference to Marx was not Karl Marx. Oh, it, that's it, right, yeah. It's a case <laughs> called Marx against the United States, uh, which stands for the proposition that if there isn't a majority in support of the judgment, then the narrowest opinion in support of the judgment states the holding of the court. And it's often, difficult, it's often difficult to figure out what's the narrowest opinion, right? Narrowest with respect to what? Uh, Yes, all the way in the back. Does anyone want to take that on? I mean, what, I can take on part of your question, the second part. I mean, one of the ironies of different levels of scrutiny for race and gender is that it's easier, well, it's an irony if you have a certain point of view, uh, I think it's an irony, is that it's easier to justify an affirmative action program for women than it is for racial and ethnic minorities, right? Because that's what, intermediate, that's what it means, intermediate scrutiny, right, means across the board, right? It doesn't just apply to um, conceitedly invidious distinctions, right, but um, uh, 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 affirmative action programs, whether you agree with them or not, right, uh, you might be able to distinguish from, 
say, the Jim Crow, uh, the, the Jim Crow South and the way race was used, was used then or the kinds of gender classifications that traditionally have subordinated women. So I think it's harder to challenge an affirmative action program for women because this level of scrutiny is intermediate scrutiny. It's the kind of scrutiny that the liberals on the court would apply to a race-conscious affirmative action program. In terms of the first question, is uh, who does it end up benefiting? Does it end up benefiting women more than racial and ethnic minorities? I just don't know. Um, I just don't know the answer to the question, although I, I, I think it's a really good one. Okay, so other, uh, yes? Um, Professor Charles mentioned that they did, there was a research done about the 10% plan and it wasn't achieving the goals. What number of those 305 African Americans that went to UT under the 10% plan, what does that reflect to the number of, um, the percent of, for the number of African Americans that would have gotten admission under the 10% plan? Like how many of them are accepting or going to UT because of the plan, or, and does that have a difference between African Americans going as members of the 10% compared to whites? I, could, I was thinking especially for like um, low income high, uh, high schools, like one near where I taught in, in Houston, um, where students may not be able to or want to go to University of Texas for other reasons, and so the, the plan is not encouraging enough minorities to go, or is, are there any numbers to that effect, or? What percent of, of African Americans are attending UT as a consequence of the 10% plan? Yeah. Is that okay. what you're saying? Yeah, so if, of all those African Americans who would get in under the 10% plan, how many of them are actually going? In other words, admitted versus cool. enrolled. Yeah. Right, how, ma what, yeah, how many I, African Americans are admitted? Yeah, I don't know how many African Americans are admitted. Um, I, I'm guessing it's in the record, but I don't know how many. I don't know if you. Yeah, no, I. I we just have the. I, would, I have numbers before me for enrolled. Um, admits, I, I would look at the Fifth Circuit opinion, I'm not sure. I didn't think, uh, when I read the Fifth Circuit opinions, anything much turned on this, that you get a very different picture from admits, and so the real problem is getting them to go, right? I, I don't think that that's, um, I'm not certain about it, but I don't think that was, right, one of, the, one of the real considerations in play. Certainly Judge Jones didn't emphasize that, that it's really about recruiting. And just to make uh, one quick point about that pool that links something to what Professor Jones said. So one of the issues that make the Texas 10% plan politically palatable is that it creates uh, multiple alliances, particularly with poor whites um, and who have never been able to get into UT, right, who are now under the 10% plan able to get into UT. Uh, and so the social mobility of the 10% plan is actually quite remarkable. And the pressure is now coming in the other direction, right, from a number of um, uh, schools who traditionally sent their kids to UT, um, but under the 10% plan has become a little bit harder because now you've expanded the different sets of pools of kids that would go to the flagship school. So it's an interesting um, coalition question with different groups of legislators in particular who now have a vested interest um, uh, cutting both across class and race. And indeed, you get some intergroup conflicts as well because there are some people of color who fall just outside the 10% in some schools who are not getting access uh, to the flagship campuses in the, UC, in the UT system uh, anymore. And that means that some people of color are now uh, disgruntled because they have an expectation based upon their high school that they ought to have access to uh, the University of Texas and some of those individuals are not necessarily uh, securing it. I just wanted to comment on your question about the difference between race uh, and gender, right? Because it is uh, documented that affirmative action has in fact uh, helped women uh, substantially, whether it's helped women more uh, than people of color proportionately, I'd have to do some more investigation uh, into that. But coming back to what Professor Siegel said, the reason that we have different uh, levels of scrutiny when it comes to race and gender is because we have different perceptions, uh, right, and different stereotypes that come into play when it comes to race and gender. So uh, especially when you look at the justices who are colorblind adherents, they think that there is no relevancy to race and racial classifications themselves are per se uh, illegitimate. Whereas I think that when you even look at those justices, they, they, they tend to think that there is uh, some, there are some circumstances in which gender uh, and gender differences might be relevant uh, to outcomes and therefore uh, a, 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 an affirmative action program that's directed towards gender might be deemed to be less suspicious, less suspect. Uh, than one that's directed at race. So it's the perceptions of difference 
right, when it comes to race and gender that may uh, make affirmative action programs uh, directed at race uh, much more problematic because race is supposedly irrelevant, right, in our social context. Mm -hmm. Whereas gender, uh, according to some justices and some individuals, uh, is not. Uh, yeah. um, so there's been a lot of, since sort of leading up to Grutter and the Michigan cases and sort of past that, a lot of higher educational research around the um, like curricular educational impact of having diverse classrooms and administration sort of crafting that into their mission statements or even um, I think Michigan requires now in a group dialogue as a first year class and sort of building more of those. It's not about access, it's about the experience and the benefits of having a diverse population and what employers want from us. Does, do you think that that argument has anywhere to go or does Gruder kind of represent the furthest courts are willing to go looking at that? Just a, just a one quick anecdote, which will not necessarily answer the question, but I guess that's what professors are for. Um, uh, so when I was a student at Michigan, we started a journal of race and law, and we got complete flack from the administration the whole, the whole way through until the very end. Um, but then was to find, find out that when they were sued, um, that one of the things that they touted was sort of the importance of diversity of, look at all the stuff that we have going on. We have our students starting journals just like this, which wouldn't have happened had we not, uh, had, we not had a, a diverse classroom and, and diverse education, et cetera. So it's, it's interesting to see to what extent do we care about diversity, right? To what extent do we really care about access? To what extent do we really care about equality? So one provocative way of thinking about what something Professor Miller said would be to say, look, let them strike this, the, 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 uh, the whole civil rights framework down on, uh, on, on its head, especially in higher education on the diversity rationale, and then let's have a political process debate about how to think about equality, because to what extent really are we concerned that intergroup dialogue is the purpose of um, providing access to state students of color or to whites or to Latinos or to women, et cetera. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the underlying question and tension in these cases. Is this, is this truly kabuki theater or, um, or do we think that there's something, you know, when we bring out the social psychology, when we brought up Pat Gurren in the Michigan cases, uh, was that really to provide evidence of benefits of diversity or simply to shore up um, what the university wanted to do on other grounds. You know, can I come in? I actually think that, yes, the court did reach its high point in terms of pressing the diversity rationale in Grutter, right? Because if you think about whether this is going to work in other contexts, like the workplace, can an employer use the diversity rationale to uh, try to have a more integrated workplace? Ricci sort of suggests that that's not going to go very far, right? Uh, and then when you look at diversity in primary and secondary education, where one could argue that if you want to foster diversity, you should be trying to reach uh, young kids in their formative years, parents involved suggest that the court, or at least a plurality of the justices are not going to accept the diversity rationale uh, in uh, that uh, circumstance. Of course, it wasn't the primary argument that was being made uh, by the defendants in that case, but it looks as if the court is not going to accept uh, diversity in primary and secondary education. So uh, that takes us back to Grutter. Um, it looks like that was the high point uh, in terms of pushing uh, diversity beyond higher education, which the court uh, described as special, right, in Grutter and Graz, uh, to other contexts like the workplace uh, and perhaps primary and secondary education as well. Well, we are, we are past time, and I know there are still some hands, so um, please come on down and ask your questions if you have them. I want to thank uh, my, my panelists, and I want to thank all of you for being with us today uh, to talk about this very important subject. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.